Well, hello everybody. I can't tell you how happy I am to be here tonight. I am so grateful for the opportunity to tell you all my story. I have suffered untold, indescribable heartbreak in my life over the terrible damage that my older sister has done to our culture. You cannot know how sad my soul is over what her effect has been on our country and on the world. You know, they say that in all the world wars, and all the wars all over the world through history, a billion people have died. But did you know that since 1980, seven years after Roe v. Wade, do you know that one and a half billion individuals have been murdered in their mother's wombs across the world? A half a billion more than all the people who've died in all of our wars. This is such a disaster. <clears throat> now in the 1960s, I was caught up by the leftist movement, which crept across America since the 1917 Russian Revolution, as its atheistic communism bled through our universities, institutions, and media, until it is now the underlying philosophy of our duped society, twisting American thought into something unrecognizable as either American or even Western. How did this happen to a girl growing up in the 50s in orderly, God-fearing St. Paul, Minnesota? Attending Catholic convent schools, I was a model of bourgeois girlhood. My older sisters, Sally and Katie, were more rebellious. Kate expelled from every school she attended, <laughs> laid a dangerous path as I'd enter classes to find them lying in wait for me. Uh-oh, another millet. And I would again have to wrangle my way out of her terrible reputation. Our maternal grandfather, Patrick Henry Feely, was an American patriarchal pioneer who founded Farmington, Minnesota and fathered eight children as he established the largest grain elevator in Minnesota. He was Farmington's mayor, postmaster, head of the school board, and started the Democrat Farmer Labor Party of Minnesota. My mother, the youngest of his eight, and the only one to graduate from college, raised us girls as emancipated women to whom she was determined to give college educations. I grew up sharing bunk beds with Kate, who would rage against men and boys. We're just as good as any boy, and we can do anything they can do. She carried on about changing the world, changing the world, along with getting rich and famous, rich and famous. Despite the two angry tomboys as my sisters, I didn't mind boys, though they bullied me coming home from school. It's a millet, kill it. I saw them as a bit dangerous until sixth grade when I, I felt a strange thrill seated next to a boy and found I liked it. <laughs> Once aware of the national, natural dance between male and female, I saw it as great fun. What an adventure, what joy. <clears throat> Kate graduated from University of Minnesota, Phi Beta Kappa, magna cum laude, and then attended Oxford, where she did three years in two and came out with first honors. The only American woman to do so in Oxford's history. We were all very proud of her. Once she emerged from school, however, she was atheistic and disturbingly anti-American. And when my high school nuns heard I was following mother and sister to the U of M, they said I'd come out an atheist and a communist. I went there anyway. And four years later, I came out an atheist and a communist, just like Katie five years before. 
Later, when I was a young divorcee, starting anew with a little child, Kate called me into the big city. Come to New York. We're starting the National Organization for Women. We're making revolution. We're changing the world, changing the world, changing the world. Mistaking her for sanctuary in my post-divorce disorientation, I figured that she had grown up. It was 1969, and I was staying at her Bohemian Bowery loft as she finished her Columbia University PhD thesis, Sexual Politics. <clears throat> when she took me to a meeting at her friend Lila Karp's place in Greenwich Village, a consciousness raising, sort of like Mao's China. Twelve women gathered at a large table where they opened with a kind of Catholic litany. This time, it was Marxism, the church of the left. The chairwoman opened. Why are we here today, she asked. To make revolution, they answered. What kind of revolution, she replied. The cultural revolution, they chanted. And how do we make cultural revolution, she demanded. By destroying the American family, they answered. How do we destroy the family, she came back. By destroying the American patriarch, they cried exuberantly. And how do we destroy the American patriarch, she probed, by taking away his power. How do we do that? By destroying monogamy, they shouted. How can we destroy monogamy? Their answer left me breathless. By promoting promiscuity, eroticism, prostitution, abortion, and homosexuality. They yelled. Was I on planet Earth? Who were these people? They were fine, young, educated American women. One of them, Catherine Stimson, was the niece of FDR's Secretary of War. They were hell-bent on utterly deconstructing Western society by infiltrating American institutions with the revolution. The media, universities, high schools, K-12, school boards, etc. Then the, the judiciary, the legislatures, the executive branches, and even the library system. Now remember, this was 1969, and the city was teeming with exotic intrigues based on the degradation of the bourgeoisie. Columbia University was coughing up groups inspired by Marx, Engels, Freud, the Frankfurt School, John Dewey, Wilhelm Reich, even Dr. Spock, another grad of Columbia, who in 1946 wrote Baby and Child Care. The Vietnam protests were a fire marches every other day as my sister's crowd grew. Kate's PhD thesis, Sexual Politics, was a bestseller. On August 31st, 1970, she was on the cover of Time magazine. Other magazines, speeches, talk shows, while Angela Davis, Gloria Steinem, Yoko Ono and John Lennon, Simone de Beauvoir, and other questionable dignitaries swarmed about Kate as she was declared the godmother of the revolution. Again, we were all so proud of her. My friend Lisa Shreve joined my daughters in my household, and she and I adopted Kate's leftism, full-blown hippies, living in a grungy Bowery loft right around the corner from Kate, Lisa is here tonight. I'd like to introduce her. Could you stand up, Lisa? <laughs> she lived through it all and can vouch for my every word because some of it is so preposterous, I actually do need a witness. <laughs> Kate Millett, Bill Ayers, you remember Bill Ayers of Barack Obama? Kate Millett, Bill Ayers, and Mark Rudd spurred the 60s Columbia riots and took over the university in a fateful move from which academia has not recovered. 
While Millet, Rudd, and Ayers were tearing down Columbia in the 60s, my current colleague, David Horowitz, was making revolution at UC Berkeley. What we did was terrible, Horowitz now says. He founded Ramparts Magazine. You remember Ramparts? The mouthpiece of the anti-war movement? He recalls standing with Tom Hayden, who later married Jane Fonda, during a nasty conflict. It was really ugly, he writes. Tear gas cans were flying. Tom turned to David and said, you know, we need to lure these middle class kids to where the police will crack their heads and that'll make them radicals. I was horrified, Horowitz says. The US left Vietnam and the communists slaughtered two and a half million peasants. That's when I knew I could no longer be a leftist, Horowitz states. If you believe that you can create heaven on earth through social justice, what lies will you not tell? In 1971, our hippie pal, Billy Maynard, phoned Lisa and me to say the living theater arrested in Brazil on drug charges could return to America only if someone would take them in. Founded in 1947, the oldest radical theater group in the US, known for far left guerrilla theater, nine of them moved into our loft with us. Lisa and I were eking out a meager living. So it was a shock when we'd come wearily home to find the fridge cleaned out the place a mess, with the living theater doing yoga, or spread all over the place smoking dope, or sleeping. They were mostly down in the dumps, and highly self-destructive. Besotted with alcohol and drugs, most everyone on the left is deeply depressed. They're miserable, and they want us all to be miserable. Nothing makes them more miserable than happiness. <laughs> Atheists to the core, they were brooding students of Karl Marx. We'd gaze into the empty fridge as they yapped about the evils of capitalism and the meaninglessness of money. <laughs> money is piffle, money is nothing. We'd worked ourselves limp, waitressing for hours. For what? Oh, right, money. For which we spent on a pantry of food already gobbled up by these remarkably dirty, disheveled parasites whose humiliations we endured for months until somehow we managed to kick them out. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> much of this might not have happened without Dr. Spock's 1946 publication, Baby and Child Care, creating the new child of the 50s and 60s, a spoiled, impulsive, narcissistic, pot-smoking, unpatriotic result of Spock's permissiveness and instant gratification, mixed with atheistic Madeline Murray, who took God out of the schools, Eutossian Kate Millett, taking mommy out of the home, what a witch's brew, no? Permissiveness and instant gratification, fold in a motherless home, mix in godless schools, and what kind of a cake do you think you will get from that? Winston Churchill calls socialism a philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance, and the gospel of envy. Its inherent virtue is the equal sharing of miser misery. Karl Marx himself said, socialism, remember this when you're arguing with people this election period about socialism, socialism is the thin end of the communist wedge. Marx himself said that. Once they're socialists, he said, communism is inevitable. Now, Karl Marx, who dreamed of the dissolution of private property, marriage, and religion, said, quote, when atheism begins, communism begins. For communism, atheism is vital. But yet, when God is removed, 
secular humanism enters in, which invokes paganism, exotic Eastern cults, concepts like EST, Scientology, bioenergetics, and witchcraft. Philosopher Roger Scruton says, high culture is precarious and endures only if underpinned by a tradition and by an endorsement of the surrounding social norms. When these things evaporate, high culture is superseded by a culture of fakes. There are fake beliefs, fake opinions, fake news, fake expertise. There is fake emotion when people debase the language in which true feelings can take root so that they lose awareness of the difference between the true and the false, unquote. So a ploy of the left is to skew vocabulary, invent new words, or change meanings to remold society. Abortion is women's health. Childless is child-free. Making love mutates to having sex. Mrs. and Miss became Ms. They play with redesigning society, and socialism becomes an accepted idea. The word social is so pleasant. Paul Kengor, an expert on communism, writes in his book, Takedown. Kate Millett, channeled all of her revolutionary nostrums into a campaign to take down traditional marriage and family, unquote. He indicts three people for the dissembling of Western society, Karl Marx, Herbert Marcuse, and Kate Millett. You see, bullying is an art form of the left. Many think the distortion of our world was inadvertent, just sort of the way things went. But David Horowitz and I understand how consciously contrived it was because we are the people who did it. Bullying and lying are quintessential to winning the cause. You all probably know that Norma McGorvey, the Roe in the landmark case, never killed the baby. She gave birth while they tried the case. She admitted that she was a leftist pawn and that she lied when she said she was raped. On the left, lying is a positive political action. Vladimir Lenin said, to tell the truth it is a petty bourgeois habit, whereas for us to lie is justified by our objectives. In 1944, at a communist convention at Madison Square Garden, Alexander Trachtenberg, a known socialist, said, when we get ready to take the US, we won't take it under the label of communism or socialism. Oh no, these labels are unpleasant to the American people. We will take the United States under labels we have made lovable, progressivism, liberalism, or democracy, but take it, we will. Zimbabwean dictator Robert Mugabe died this past September 6th, the second anniversary of my sister's death. Helen Raleigh of the Federalist Society wrote, Mugabe wasn't the only charismatic socialist who ruined a country and the lives of millions. His rule should remind us that socialism Whoever his charismatic spokesperson may be will always turn a country into a hell on earth. Now, the target of communism is the family. Reich declared the family had to be dismantled. Smash monogamy was his motto. He believed in children's and teenagers' right to natural love. He was obsessed with the orgasm and its function. He's the one who coined the phrase sexual revolution. Engels wished for the, quote, gradual growth of unconstrained sexual intercourse and with it a more tolerant public opinion regarding a maiden's honor 
and a woman's shame, unquote. The communist system flows with satanic logic. Now, my favorite economist philosopher, Thomas Sowell, writes, quote, one of the common failings among honorable people is a failure to appreciate how thoroughly dishonorable some people are, some people can be, and how dangerous it is to trust them. Popes over 200 years have called communism, quote, the second oldest religion with the words of temptation, ye shall be as gods. Full of deceit and cunning, satanic, violent, destructive, deceptive. Bishop Sheen called it the new barbarism. The father of community organizing, Saul Alinsky, you've heard of Saul Alinsky. He's another grad of Columbia and a 60s Chicago collectivist, preached Marxist socialism with ideas such as noble ends justify corrupt means. Both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama honed their skills on Alinsky. She wrote her Wellesley thesis on Alinsky, who dedicated his book, Rules for Radicals, to Lucifer. Dedicated his book to Lucifer. In a Playboy interview, Alinsky said, quote, if there's an afterlife and I have anything to say about it, I will unreservedly choose hell. Hell would be heaven for me. Once I get into hell, I'll start organizing the have-nots with a smile. They're my kind of people." Unquote. Alinsky tells radicals, quote, strive to raw people's resentments, strive to rub raw people's resentments, fan latent hostility to the point of overt expression, and quote, agitate to the point of conflict. Radicals must unify against the identifiable enemy, caricatured as the personification of evil. His formula, pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. He tells acolytes to cultivate in people's hearts a negative emotional response to the face of that target. He advises them to frame the target as 100% evil. Never concede that an opponent might have admirable qualities. Their preferred target today, of course, is our President Donald Trump. In the 50s, Alinsky co-opted Roman Catholic clerics Bishop Bernadine of Chicago and Father John Egan, who later ran Notre Dame University, nodding Alinskyism into Catholic culture so that now the Catholic colleges and universities are barely recognizable as even Catholic. After the women at Larle Carp's house in 1969 spun their plot to invade our institutions, my sister Kate went all over the country establishing women's studies in nearly every college and university in America. She personally founded these studies groups. Niall Ferguson out of Stanford and Harvard speaks of the decline and fall of history. Quote, undergraduates are shunning history. Compared with 1971, he says, the share of history degrees has gone from 18% in 1971 to 9% because of an enormous increase in historians specializing in women and gender. Gender is now the single most important subfield of the academy in America. The most significant events are ignored, barely covered, are the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, World Wars I and II, the Cold War. Harvard offers History 1954, emotions in history which questions the impact of the historian's emotions in writing history. Scholar Camille Paglia described Kate Millett's scholarship as deeply flawed. 
declaring that, quote, American feminism's nosedive began when Millet achieved prominence. According to Paglia, Millet's sexual politics, quote, reduced complex artworks to their political contact, content and attacked famous male artists and authors for their alleged sexism, thereby sending serious academic literary appreciation and criticism into eclipse. Left-wing teachers politicize with an insistence on judging the past by the moral standards of the present. Niall Ferguson states these teachers, quote, neglect the defining events of modern history in favor of topics that are arcane or agitprop. Students flee, and the United States of amnesia looms. My sister Kate's women's studies courses denounce marriage, which she calls a patriarchal unit within a patriarchal whole, preaching sexual revolution to create, quote, an end to traditional inhibitions and taboos, particularly those that threaten monogamous marriage, homosexuality, illegitimacy, adolescent child and pre and extramarital sexuality, in women's studies classes, your daughters are taught, be an outlaw, be a damned outlaw. All law was concocted by dead white men. Be a slut and be proud of it. So young women now wear t-shirts with the word slut embrazened across the chest, just to let us know they're liberated. Germaine Greer, advocated for the abolition of monogamous marriage. Feminists call pregnancy barbaric. They prefer artificial reproduction. Greer, with a Cambridge PhD, encouraged women to taste their own menstrual blood and discouraged them from monogamy. Women, Greer claimed, have very little idea how much men hate them, unquote. These women are driven by violent impulses toward men to establish a matriarchy because if women read our world, there'd be no more war. <laughs> a simple-minded error of logic. What they've done, actually, is enervate our men, destroy masculinity, and thus embolden our enemies who see us as easy pickings. No nation is easier to overwhelm than one which has feminized its men. Just because most of the people around you have collapsed into evil does not mean that truth has lost its meaning. Kenneth Minogue in National Review wrote, an ideological movement is a collection of people, many of whom could hardly bake a cake, fix a car, sustain a friendship or a marriage, or even do a quadratic equation. Yet they believe they know how to rule the world. The university has become the natural habitat of the ideological enthusiast, a kind of adventure playground carefully insulated from reality. It has become the institutional base for civilizational self-hatred. Now, if the definition of insanity is a pursuit of delusion at all costs, then one may say that the definition of, of sanity is a pursuit of reality at all costs. Marxist feminism, feminists call for a revolutionary process resulting in a drastic depopulation in the number of males to about 10% of the human race. Delusion, pursued at all costs, reigns supreme on the left. On a site titled Love Stinks, one Elizabeth Lewis writes, quote, it's no longer in the interest of our species to have heterosexuals fornicating. We need no breeding of humans which endanger our existence. 
homosexuality should be here to stay for centuries to get the population under control. We can referendum heterosexuality in oh, 2513 or so. <laughs> Speaking of delusion, one Halloween night, Kate invited Lisa and me to her party. We mounted three steep stories to her place to find a long, low table with 12 placemats, each of which held a plate under a bowl of water, with a large, sharp knife set across that. At each place sat a naked woman, cross-legged on a large cushion. One woman at the end of the table had a gigantic live snake coiled around her obese nude self. It must have been 10 feet long and at least 8 to 10 inches in diameter. Lisa and I were dumbstruck. We had removed our shoes as requested. Kate invited us to join the ritual, but we muttered something about observing. As they resumed their ritual, we tiptoed to our shoes and crept out, running down those flights, our, beat fairly, our feet barely touching the steps as we burst out onto the Bowery, chased by Satan himself, shaking and huffing in shock and terror. Summer 1970, Kate decided that she, Lisa Shreve and I, should make the first all-woman film. Even the deli person delivering sandwiches had to be female. It was an ordeal at the hands of Kate's delusions which nearly killed us. If not from heat stroke, suicide, or homicide, then sheer despair and exhaustion. Every kind of despotism, chaos, and irrational violence which Kate could muster fell down upon us during one of the hottest summers on record. Called Three Lives, the movie profiles three women. Lisa's mom, Lillian Shreve, a housewife and mother who also worked as a chemist, a Marxist lesbian, Robin Mide, and myself. Kate turned each of us into graphic symbols of her worldview, bold-faced communist propaganda, which had little to do with those of us being profiled. She cut 11 hours of footage on me into an uncanny half-hour portrait of herself in stunning artifice. She did the same with Lisa's mom, who never got over the betrayal. It was chicly premiered at the Bleecker Street Cinema in Greenwich Village on a double bill with Ingmar Bergman's persona, starring Lee Volman and B.B. Anderson. One Sunday, my phone rang at 7 a.m. This is Vanessa Redgrave. Not funny, who is this at 7 a.m.? No, this is really Vanessa. Kate had told her that I was in a comedy troupe, six of us created, a precursor to Saturday Night Live, spoofing current events with a leftist POV. Vanessa was bringing a day of leftist indoctrination to a Lower East Side school and wanted us for comic relief. I was struck by her drab, nonstop monotone while staring just to the side of my head. No eye contact, and every word propaganda. The People's Committee for the People's Benefit concerning the People's Collective, the People's Actions of the whatever, the whatever, always a gobbledygook about this conference and that committee and the people's, 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 people's. Like a robot misprogrammed with nonsense. She called me often and always at ungodly hours, six or seven in the morning, keeping me on the phone, straining to grasp her long communist diatribes, much about Palestine, as she was rabid with anti-Semitism. It was beyond wearying. I seriously could drop off into a doze, and she hadn't a clue. My shock came. Oh, wait a minute here. I just need to. My shock came the day of our gig at a large public school auditorium in New York City in the United States of America. As we entered a cavernous auditorium draped floor to ceiling, 
all along the walls, front to back, with huge red flags, ablaze with a yellow hammer and sickle. I thought we were in Soviet Russia. What on earth? I mean, I was into our revolution, our movement, but no one had ever flashed that flag. So a sickening feeling flooded me as we mounted the stage with the American fathers, sons, daughters, sisters, moms, uncles, aunts, brothers, and husbands who had died fighting communism worldwide, swarming about my mind as the violently red hammer and sickle danced about my eyes. I began to edge away from Vanessa and the left and cautiously toward God. You know, as soon as one accepts God, everything changes. Lisa converted to Catholicism and was editing a documentary on Mother Teresa. She asked my husband and me if we'd like to meet her. We jumped at the chance. Lisa's co-workers knew Mother for some years, and when they'd asked her what was the worst thing in the world, she had quickly replied, abortion. Now when we met her and we asked her the same question, she said, the taking of the Holy Eucharist in the hand. We were shocked as this was church sanctioned, but upon further contemplation, we saw that she meant that we have lost the sense of the sacred because we have crossed that sacred line of humanity, the eternal taboo forbidding the murder of one's own child in its mother's womb. The sense of the sacred had been crushed. As Dostoevsky says, if, da if God does not exist, then everything is permissible. Lisa and I came to see this witchcraft, lesbianism, atheistic politics as psychotic. Look, it's just plain crazy to convince women that not only is it good to murder your own baby, but it's imperative that you buck up, get the courage to do it for the sake of your own future, but also for the planet. Because one of the urban myths soaking its way through society was the population explosion. Looming ahead of us in a dark, threatening future. The popular idea was that by 2000, there would not be an acre of unoccupied land on the planet, as the population explosion was an inescapable reality where there would be no more water, with many hungry, desperate, dirty, thirsty barbarians grappling over the last two acres on Earth. And it held just as big a place in urban thought as does today's global warming. It was an absolute, it was beyond discussion, a scientific fact, and we'd better get on the stick and solve it. Why would a decent woman bring a tiny person into this nightmare? Babies became the enemy of mankind, of women, and of our futures. What a perfect moment to shove Roe v. Wade down the throats of Americans. It was a good thing to kill babies. It was the kind, merciful, compassionate, and conscientious thing to do. It's your body. But no, it's not. For what human body has two beating hearts, four eyes, two noses, four legs, 20 fingers, and 20 toes? In 1973, Roe v. Wade became law. Elation. Everyone ran right out like good little revolutionaries and committed infanticide. <laughs> Sexual revolution was in full bloom. Freedom. But what of the American man? If your woman's pregnant, is it just fine 
that she's the whole Roman circus rolled up into one? She has entire privilege over you? Your own son or daughter lives or dies by her whim? You have no say? This is a gargantuan nightmare resulting in the loss of true femininity, a tender compassion full of comfort, nurture, firmness, and gentleness. I say that the natural order of things is for men to run the world and for women to run society. Once women decided that they're identical to men lusting after briefcases, corporate and government positions, and forsaking the shaping of their communities, society began to crumble. Without the firm hand of a mother in the home managing rulemaking, supported by the Ten Commandments and the grooming of family, which then naturally flows from the home and travels into all the offices, bureaus, and all departments of life, our world has collapsed, deteriorated into an anarchical mess, rampant with drugs, crimes, disconnectedness, massive rudeness, obesity, slovenliness, tattoos, riots in our streets and airplanes, and mass murder. Someone said to me, you grant too much power to these women around Lila Karp's table in 1969 Greenwich Village. I had to laugh because that's nothing new. The power of a handful of people is immense. Seven men sitting on a nine-person court made Roe v. Wade the law of the land. Hitler demolished Europe, starting with a handful of brown shirts. Whereas Jesus Christ, with only 12 other guys and a few women, has saved billions of souls. One of the egregious errors of the left is the denial of human nature and the power of one individual. They're always calling for unity. Can't we all agree? Yet quarreling is our nature. When you hear the word collective, run for your life, unity describes group think, where all are in agreement, completely unnatural. That's totalitarianism. That's fascism. Our American constitutional system is a beauty, taking into account that we are divisive, argumentative, and allows us safe venues wherein we disagree and argue passionately. That's how to form a balanced society, arrive at law and order. It's the pursuit of reality at all costs. The monstrous lies, permutations, awkward configurations, and outright psychic gymnastics through which the mind must struggle to throw in with the left are astonishing. Faust barters his soul to Mephistopheles, who bids him, evil be thou my good. On April 26, 2013, Barack Obama, the first president to address Planned Parenthood, thanked that group, which murders 300,000 uh, uh, murdered babies a year, but he added, God bless you. Aha, evil be thou my good. That same year, on June 20th, 2013, in the New York Times, a woman tells the ending of her son's budding life, for which she is grateful. Quote, I made sure my son died in a warm and loving place inside of me. Evil be thou my good. Nancy Pelosi, who laughably calls herself Catholic, says infanticide is sacred ground. Evil be thou my good. Not St. Mother Teresa's good by a long shot. She said, no one is safe around a mother who would murder her own child. One of my cherished friends, Father George Rutler, says, 
There is no more important figure in the world than a mother. I say the dignity of a human is in direct proportion to that person's relationship to the sacred. The purpose of the sacred is to radiate dignity upon the perceiver, and it is the perceiver who grants and bestows such dignity to the sacred. Lisa's and my friend Franny gave birth to a baby in the sixth month. She weighed a pound and a half and could be held in the palm of daddy's hand. They named her Dana, and they fought their hearts out to make her live. It cost $500,000 to where she could come home. Then more incalculable struggles and funds. Today, she's a lovely five foot 10 young lady, and recently we attended her wedding. She's gorgeous. <laughs> Yet women who don't want to face reality can murder their baby when it's two months further in gestation than Dana. Now what, is Dana's life more worthy of the struggle and heartache it took to save her while the inconvenient baby is a worthless thing thrown out into the trash? Where is equality under the Constitution? It's applied willy-nilly according to the whim of one lone woman. The campaign against monogamy and for enforced promiscuity by the Bill Ayers Weathermen gang was from the women in the gang. Again, I say, it's women who direct and control society. Bishop Sheen stated that, quote, the level of civilization is always the level of its womanhood. He went on to say, quote, when a man loves a woman, he must prove worthy of her. The higher her virtue, the more noble her character, the more devoted she is to truth, justice, goodness, the more he has to aspire to be worthy of her. The history of civilization could actually be written in terms of the level of its women. The normalizing of infanticide begins with the dehumanization of the unborn person. The practitioner's heart grows harder, making it possible to perpetrate the ugliest of crimes against humanity without a twinge of conscience. It's particularly easy when it unleashes a tsunami of cold, seductive cash into the hands of practitioners who operate killing mills with impunity. You know, paganism always brings child sacrifice. Planned Parenthood, which performs 300,000 infant murders a year, contrary to their claim, does no mammograms, no prenatal care, no pap smears, none. These predators have developed a perfectly heinous formula. Early child sex education into promiscuity and contraception are de rigueur. Contraception fails 54% of the time, but you can always kill the resulting child. So in primary schools, very young children are led down the road of desensitization. G.K. Chesterton said, the worst criminals are not murderers and thieves. The worst criminals are the intellectuals who give the wrong food to children and pervert them. Friedrich Engel's dream of unrestrained sexual intercourse at last, sexual revolution, free love, pansexuality, everything allowed as the Planned Parenthood killing mills grind in a perpetual river of desperate clients paying piles of unending cash. Minorities are really hard hit. In New York City, more black babies are killed annually than are born. Killing on this industrial scale is America's greatest moral calamity since slavery, and it must be stopped. Yeah. Jesus said, I came so they might have life and have it more abundantly. 
after 45 years of legalized infanticide promoted by the American left, out of wedlock births have increased and the plight of poor women has worsened. This blossoms from Margaret Sanger's racist eugenics to stop the multiplying of the unfit, to breed a race of thoroughbreds, so as to stop impoverished non-white women from breeding like weeds. In a New York Post piece titled Born Supremacy, someone named Reed Tucker wrote, quote, in the next 20 years, we may create perfect babies with Hollywood looks and genius IQs without eggs, sperm, or sex. No love, no love, no love creating other human beings. Could this lead to a master race or a healthier future? Margaret Sanger smiles in hell as she dances with Saul Alinsky. Those of us who have an inkling of the true nature of love find ourselves menaced by barbarity today. Without, we have bloodthirsty Islamic terrorists who dream of extinguishing us forever. Within, our babies are stalked by their own mothers. This springs from the callous damaged hearts of these Marxist feminists who hire strangers to extinguish eager hearts, persons who spring from eggs inside their very own wombs. The black stain of this barbarous business, a money machine, I must most strongly emphasize, a money machine, a money machine, a money machine, has blocked entrance to earth of 70 million American men and women who had they been born would have eliminated our struggles over social security or the workforce. The prayer probably said most often across the earth is to Christ's holy mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. The fruit of her womb was Jesus, savior of humankind who said, whatsoever you do unto the least of these my brethren, you do also unto me. This means that every person in utero is another fruit of the womb, a tiny helpless Jesus. This means each infanticide performed is another crucifixion of our blessed savior. Thus, Planned Parenthood commits annually 300,000 crucifixions of the Christ. Okay, here's the real choice scenario. You choose a deserving man. You choose to get to know each other. You meet each other's family and friends. You choose a date and you marry before your friends and family. And only then do you give birth to a child with the consideration and profound respect that that person deserves upon coming into grapple with this extremely difficult exercise we call life. 